With the U.S. Second Corps withdrawn from battle, the British 10th and French Expeditionary Corps were unable to undertake any offensive actions with their flanks exposed and the Germans ready to concentrate all their firepower on them. The New Zealand Corps, commanded by General Freyberg, was called to replace the Americans and take on offensive operations. It consisted of the 2nd New Zealand, 4th Indian, and British 78th Infantry Divisions. Allied intelligence reported that the Germans were planning to attack the 6th Corps at Anzio on February 16th, and Freyberg was under pressure to launch a relieving action at Casino that same day. Freyberg's plan was a continuation of the first battle, one attack with the 4th Indian Division from the north along the mountain ridges, and a second attack with the New Zealand 2nd Division from the southeast and the railway station as the objective. The commander of the 4th Indian Division, Major General Francis Tucker, was trained in mountain warfare and suggested a wide outflanking movement to the left of the German line, similar to the attack of the French Expeditionary Corps during the first battle. Freyberg and General Clark rejected his suggestion as being time-consuming and ineffective. Tucker reluctantly accepted Freyberg's plan, setting, however, a non-negotiable term. He requested the destruction of the monastery by aerial bombing, regardless of whether it was currently occupied by the Germans. So far, one notable aspect of the battle was the accuracy of German artillery. Allied soldiers and officers alike came to believe that the Germans had artillery observers inside the monastery, although many nearby hills offered a much better view of the Allied positions. Freyberg agreed with Tucker and transmitted the request to General Clark's staff on February 12th. Chief of Staff of the U.S. Fifth Army, Major General Grenther, reminded Freyberg that the monastery had been classified as a historical monument and that it's not even on the list of potential targets. Freyberg replied that it is definitely on his own list of targets and demanded its destruction. General Clark had already rejected the idea of bombing the monastery when the subject was discussed several weeks earlier. Moreover, Eisenhower's order for the protection of cultural monuments was still in effect. Clark also knew that destroyed buildings were often in better defensive positions than intact ones. Aerial reconnaissance showed no German presence in the monastery's courtyard, and General Clark tried to dissuade Freyberg and warn him that the Germans could occupy the ruins after the bombing. Freyberg closed the conversation by pointing out that if any senior commander refuses to authorize the bombing, he would have to be prepared to accept full responsibility for a failure of his planned attack. In the end, the commander-in-chief of the Allied armies in Italy, General Harold Alexander, trusted Freyberg's judgment and authorized the bombing. On February 14th, the commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean Allied Air Forces, Lieutenant General Ira Aker, responded to Freyberg's request and promised to flatten the monastery with 142 B-17 heavy bombers, followed by 47 B-25 Mitchell and 40 B-26 Marauder medium bombers. Because of harsh weather and requirements on other fronts, the date of the raid could be arranged only for the morning of February 15th. Meanwhile, General Tucker fell seriously ill and was urgently transported to a hospital in Caserta. He was replaced by Brigadier Harry de Molina as commander of the 4th Indian Division. To de Molina and his officers, the plan didn't make any sense. The bombing could possibly have a tactical effect if it was closely followed by an immediate advance of ground forces. In this case, the infantry could attack only at night, and before an attack on the monastery itself, they first had to capture Point 593. What followed at 0930 hours on February 15th was a furious demonstration of air superiority. It was the largest air attack with only one building as the target. The Allied infantrymen cheered as they observed the spectacle, having no idea that the situation is about to get worse. When the entire top of Monte Cassino was reduced to a smoking mass of rubble, the German paratroopers occupied the destroyed monastery to expect a full-scale attack. But the 4th Indian Division was not yet fully assembled. Corps headquarters didn't appreciate the difficulties of bringing the division into place and the transportation of enough supplies over terrain that was exposed to accurate artillery fire. By nightfall, one company of the 1st Battalion, Royal Sussex Regiment, was ready to conduct a reconnaissance mission. The 66 men of C Company slowly advanced towards the German positions and came so close that it seemed as though the Germans were caught sleeping. 
At a distance of only 10 meters, the Germans opened fire, and within seconds, the company lost 34 men. The following night, the Royal Sussex Regiment attacked in battalion strength. Artillery could not be used in direct support because of the risk of hitting friendly troops. It was planned, therefore, to shell Point 575, which had been providing supportive fire to the defenders of Point 593. The attacking battalion charged against the German positions, engaging in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. By dawn, the battalion had lost half its manpower and retreated. In two successive nights, the Royal Sussex Regiment lost 174 out of a total of 330 men committed to the attacks. With his patience exhausted and obviously annoyed, Freyberg ordered a third attack the following night, this time on a broader front with a three battalion strength. The idea was to apply pressure on multiple hills, hoping that one would ultimately fall. However, all those hills comprised of a chain of strongholds that provided a panoramic view on the Allied jump-off positions. The attack began at midnight, with the three battalions attempting to fight their way forward, only to be cut down by machine gun and mortar fire. Once again, no progress was made, and on February 18th, the offensive on the mountain was called off. While the 4th Indian Division was being decimated, the 28th Maori Battalion advanced toward the Casino Railway Station. The engineers worked all night to make a clear path that would allow the tanks to come forward and support the attack. In the morning of February 18th, the Maori found themselves isolated and exposed to artillery fire. With the aid of a smokescreen laid down by Allied artillery to obscure their position to the German batteries, the Maori waited for tank support. The Germans grabbed the chance and used the smokescreen to their advantage to cover their own counterattack. By the time they were spotted through the smoke, they were too close for the Allied artillery. The German infantry, supported by only two assault guns, drove the Maori back and recaptured the railway station. Without having achieved any of his objectives, Freyberg called off Operation Avenger. The Second Battle of Monte Cassino was over.